Hello humans, automatons, memory palace architects, hand tricyclists and date wine enthusiasts. I'm Ryan Ferris and welcome to The Good Timeline. The Good Timeline is the place where we examine the global trend of transhumanism, the self-directed transformation of humans into something very different from our hunter-gatherer ancestors and how we might best make that transition. Today's guest is an old family friend, Shasa Bolton. Shasa is an inventor, engineer, adventurer, and more recently a podcaster and memory palace architect. Some years back, Shasa solo traveled across Morocco with next to no money, followed by a two and a half thousand kilometer circuit across India on nothing but a hand tricycle, searching for forgotten people who he could raise money for and give a hand trike of their own. In this global moment of closed borders, societal tension and uncertainty, I invite you to join us as Shasa takes us across Morocco and India, highlighting the commonalities of humanity through the characters he meets along the way. We keep seeming to bump into each other in moments of disasters. Yeah. Last time we, we hung out, there was the earthquakes and you, you showed up uh, at our place on the eve of both of the earthquakes, right? Um, was my it, was sister, it both of them? My sister stayed with your family oh, on, yeah, on the first, the eve of the first earthquake. That's and I was right. in Hamilton and I felt quite sort of like I'd missed out on something great. <laughs> but um, <laughs> th- then I came back and I stayed with your family uh, th- yeah, on the eve of the second earthquake. So um, <laughs> your family don't let us come to stay anymore. They, they sort of said that our younger brother, Blake, has, uh, there's no way he can ever set foot in their house. No. Because we've no. obviously got a sort of uh, an effect. Too many natural disasters followed the Boltons around. Yeah, so I didn't realise that were, I was... They were, ill-fated. they were ill-fated in Game of Thrones as well, the Boltons. Really? I, I, I don't know Game of Thrones. I didn't realise there were even Boltons in there. That's, but that's very interesting because <laughs> I, my, sister's, my sister's new baby, her name is also from the Game of Thrones as, as far as I'm aware. So, um, I hope I it's not Ramsay. No, it's, it's, a, it's a lady baby. It's, a, <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's um, <laughs> a Arya is the name. Is that Game of Thrones? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's crazy. But I think they spelled oh, it Ar- Ar- wrong. Character. I think they chose like a, a really confusing spelling where, you, where people are sort of going to call her Ariya or something along those lines. Oh, that would be good character building for her. Yeah, that's, that's the idea. I've lived my whole life having to spell my name to people and it's, it's, a, it's an icebreaker, if, if anything. <laughs> yeah, a friend of mine in Ireland, his name is Brian. Okay. But, um, it's spelt, he just says it's spelt like Brian, but wrong. And it pretty much is. It's like, I think it's B-R-I-A-I-N or something weird like that. I just okay. don't know how to spell it either. Brian. But yeah, it's the same kind of thing. That's an, an Icelandic name, did you say? Or Irish? Irish, Irish, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if I'd give my kids a... Um, I think I think a, an unusual name is good, but one that people can spell is, is really good for, for sort of search <laughs> engine optimization. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't give them yeah, one that's definitely. got an ambiguous spelling. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. So last time, last time we were hanging out, uh, we were in Akaroa, and it was when we'd sort of taken refuge from the earthquake. Yeah, and I that's right. You're working on, you're working on some kind of sculptures and engineering projects while you were there, which I found very intriguing. But that was quite some time ago now, and you've been building all sorts of machines. And you're telling me you're learning about memory palaces and myths and parables. And you did a hand cycle through India and you did an overseas experience without money and you've been looking into deep learning. So I kind of want to like have a yarn to you about all of that stuff. It could be fun to start with some of your overseas adventures. What came first? Was it the hand cycle through India or the OE without money? Uh, I'd planned the, the hand cycle through India and... I um, decided that I'd make my way to India sort of by going through a few other countries first. I had sort of a tentative date for starting India, but I knew I'd just sort of do it once I got there and um, landed in Frankfurt to start with and then just sort of made it up as as I went, at least sort of with a a few days in advance of of planning. um, What was the overarching goal here? So you had these hand cycles which can be used by disabled people that don't have legs 
They can yeah. use their arms to move themselves around. Is that? Yeah, they're basically like a wheelchair, but with a bicycle wheel at the front. So you don't use your your legs; you use your hands to power it because typically they're used by people who don't have um, use of their legs. So they could be um, could have polio and not have the strength, or they might be amputees. So I met sort of quite a few different people that that um, would benefit from it while I was over there. But um, my idea was, I, I really I, I wanted a journey with a purpose, <laughs> and um, I, I sort of found it interesting that uh, it was actually there's a book I was reading in um, the the last couple of years of uni or so, and it was called Courage and Endurance, and it's quite um, coincidentally it was one that your dad gave me. <laughs> Huh. And um, this book was just sort of stories about people who were doing these these feats of human endurance. Like I think one was about somebody searching for the Nile, the source of the Nile, and uh, another one, someone maybe was climbing Mount Everest, and another one was in a uh, uh, a Jewish concentration camp. And I, I guess I found those stories really impacting, especially the ones like the, the concentration camp where they were going through these sort of feats of human endurance but it wasn't just for fun (laughs) or to prove themselves it was actually there was a purpose behind it and i sort of often when i'd go on on tramps and things i'd I'd feel like i was just playing pretending to to have endurance and it seemed so pointless i wasn't delivering any medicine or doing anything useful i was just going out into the wilderness and i thought i want to i want to test myself but i want some some purpose towards it and also I mean, it's some, some self-discovery that can come from seeing how far you can push yourself and what you can handle and some sort of a liberating feeling and knowing what, what you're capable of. And um, so that was part of it, but also I wanted to actually do something useful at the same time. So I did it as a fundraiser. So I sort of committed to doing at least 2,000 kilometres through India, uh, all powered by my hands on a hand-powered wheelchair. So I had three wheels and... Um, then people sponsored me, so people could sponsor whatever amount they liked, and then that money all went towards purchasing um, the same brand of hand-powered cycle for people that I found as I was cycling around. So um, I had this sign on the back of the tricycle saying, take me to somebody who needs this, and I had a a big circuit mapped out across the south of India, which... um, Ended out in the end, I think, being about two and two thousand five hundred kilometers, and uh, I, I set off. <laughs> and all all along the way, people would stop me. They'd read my sign and they'd say, oh, "I know someone who needs this," and they'd say, "Follow me." And so I'd follow them on their motorbike, and they'd race off ahead. And then they'd realize that I I couldn't actually sort of go sixty kilometers an hour on this thing. <laughs> <laughs> so sort of I'd follow them, and then sort of one hour later, I'd finally get to where they wanted to show me. <laughs> And there'd be somebody there in this little little hut that um, either didn't didn't have any legs or didn't have much strength. Their legs had polio. And sort of some of them were kids, some of them were, were adults. And I'd I'd put them on the cycle and test them out, see if they were able to use it to see if it would actually um, be of benefit to them. Because some people wouldn't have had the arm strength or wouldn't have been been big enough, or they they might have not had the right terrain around their home that they would have just ended up sort of getting stuck in a ditch <laughs> very quickly and um, the, the, the people that, that it worked for that it seemed appropriate then I, I took their names down and I at the end of the whole trip I had a whole list of names that matched sort of how much funding I had managed to get and um, sent that out to a distributor in Bangalore and then they later went and distributed the cycles to all of those people that I'd discovered. That's incredible how many people was it? I think in the end it was about 23 people, which um, yeah. I'm not sure exactly what my expectations were, but um, I mean, I just felt pretty satisfied with that. And there were people that yeah. wouldn't have got discovered otherwise. Like I think a lot of them had tried to, to get funding for having a hand cycle and it sort of takes a very long time and it's hard to get. And there are people that they just a lot of their lives are spent in their home and it feels like nobody really knows they exist. So um, I think being able to get them off the ground and, and out and about could just make a huge difference to their quality of life. Yeah, definitely. 
So have you got any particular stories? I remember reading on your blog that you were writing as you were doing it years ago about a man and he'd made date palm wine or something like that. <laughs> and I think yeah. you stayed, was that in India and you stayed with him or his family? Right. That was, that was in Morocco. <laughs> That was Morocco. Oh, that, Morocco. That, 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 oh, was okay, right. that was before India, but yeah, that I, oh man, mm. my Morocco trip was interesting as well. I I wrote, <laughs> I think I only started actually turning that into a blog halfway through, but sort of just realized that I had so much good content. Like it was just incredible the people that you meet, and when you do it without any money, you're just sort of forced to end up with the most hospitable people or the most sort of <laughs> nerve-wracking people and uh or you just <laughs> and or you end up sleeping in ditches and you, uh, under bushes and freezing cold or you end up just I mean Morocco is the best place to try and travel with your thumb and without money because the people are so hospitable more than any country I've ever been to they're just pretty much every day they're inviting you into their house into their home inviting you to marry their daughter <laughs> and <just sort> of <laughs> stay forever <laughs> So it, yeah. it was quite easy to to find places to to stay each night in Morocco and and just really interesting to get a chance to actually see in behind the scenes, not just going around as a tourist. You get to actually go to some rather unglamorous locations, but sort of see what's inside their homes. And their homes in Morocco are just so incredibly simple. They were just sort of there's a, a refrigerator in one corner if you're lucky, otherwise just a gas cooker. And, uh, and a rug on the other side of the room. And sort of everyone lives in there. They just sleep on their rugs at night. And then they, then when they need food, they often go out, get the veggies, come back, cook a tagine on the gas cooker on the floor. And then um, when it's finished, when it's ready, they'll put the tagine pot in the middle of the floor, get some bread out, and everyone sits around the same pot and eats with their hands out of the same pot. And, yeah, I love it. There's hardly any dishes. <laughs> All you've got is a tagine pot <laughs> and a knife. And yeah, um, yeah. one one tagine could feed two people, or it could feed ten people. It's sort of, uh, if some other people walk in the door at a certain at the time when you're about to eat, then they um, just break the bread into a few more pieces, and and the tagine goes further. So I, yeah. I really like that simplicity to life. Like they didn't seem to have that many possessions, so sort of heaps of space to think, which. Um, Though often it was yeah fine for me as a visitor, but um, it also seemed like their lives could be a bit empty at the same time, which is not always an easy sort of judgment to make when you're um, you can't communicate completely with them because not not many people spoke English. So let's rewind a bit. So you you started in Frankfurt as you said before, and you had you must have had a little bit of money to get around. Yeah, but I had your plan was to go from Frankfurt to India. With what method? I think originally I'd planned to do it all across land. I think I wanted to go through Syria and Pakistan to get to India. But I think as I was traveling, I think Syria started to, to not become the safest place to go to. So um, mm -hmm. I didn't end up going there by land. But I went into to France and started off doing halpexing, which is sort of like woofing. So you um, you work for your, your food and your bed. So I um, started in a vineyard. And I was yeah pruning pruning vines and staying in these quaint little uh, French villages, which was was really amazing. And then moved down from there to um, to France to Spain, and uh, had some time staying with. It was hard to find local people to stay with, or, or Spanish people to stay with in Spain. I think the Spanish are a bit more um, closed with letting strangers into their homes at least I got that impression but most people that I stayed with ended up being um, British people that were living in in Spain but um, definitely stayed with some characters there I stayed with a an old inventor <laughs> who had um, he'd built all of these these boats that looked like giant animals sort of a giant frog and a giant whale and they're all boats <laughs> and uh, he okay. invented all these strange machines for for producing energy and as soon as I got there, I couldn't find him, and I heard this sort of screaming, and uh, I followed the noise, and there he was sort of standing in this sheet 
mostly naked, overweight man with a sheet wrapped around him and sort of <laughs> half of him hanging out. And <laughs> and he said, oh, there you are. <laughs> and then he then he served me up some tea that had ants floating in it. And uh, then he said, now, we've, we've got to go and test my new invention. So we, we jumped in his old truck. I just sort of met this guy and we, we drove down to a river where he wanted to test his new energy energy machine. And uh, we got we were going to the river and then the road ended. The bridge had sort of collapsed and the truck was just at the, the edge of this sort of precipice that would lead off into the, into the water below. And... Um, so we decided this wasn't the best way to go. So he tried to start the engine and the uh, the, the car wouldn't start. <laughs> so the, the battery had gone flat or something. And so he told me, oh, you're going to have to push start me. And uh, the only way to push was towards this precipice. <laughs> we sort of had a few meters to go before I'd, I'd just met this guy. And here I was pushing this old crazy man in his car towards <laughs> the edge of a cliff. And um, <laughs> luckily, the, the engine started, and he and he put the brakes on, and um, we we drove back home. But um, that was my first encounter <laughs> with this eccentric old guy. But wow. um, then, from the bottom of Spain, you can take a, a boat from there across to Morocco. So um, that's how I got to Morocco. I actually, again, I I did have some money, but I partly was trying not to spend it. It was on a on a card as well, so I think I just. I didn't have that much actual cash. But um, so when I was at the south of Spain, I got out my little travel guitar and I played some songs until I had enough money to take the um, the ferry across to Morocco. So um, oh, nice. that, that led me into Morocco, which uh, actually when I... Ro- Were you mostly hitching and then doing a bit of busking? Yeah, I didn't... the main way you were traveling? I didn't take any public transport. <laughs> um and I think I actually only busked once. That was just to get my ferry ticket. I mean, I, I just sort of play, had my little guitar with me and I played music with people as, as I met people, but um, didn't didn't do any busking. So I didn't actually earn any money. I didn't sort of want to be taking money from people if I could help it, especially when you're sort of in a, uh, a more third world country. But I yeah, yeah. also didn't feel like I had a whole lot to, to give as well. But um, so when I... When I went through Spain, I was struck by how nobody seemed to eat vegetables. I was just served sort of these constant meat dishes for sort of weeks on end. And um, now is that how it worked? I think by the time I got, or maybe it was the other way. Maybe I was staying with some vegans. <laughs> At least I definitely got served a lot of meat in Spain. But maybe the last people I stayed with were vegan. And um, so I had a few weeks with them without any meat. And I was looking forward to getting to Morocco and having my first meat meal for a, for a while. And um, so I, I got off the boat and arrived in Morocco and started to say, I'm going to hunt down a, a, a good, I'm going to actually lash out and buy something <laughs> and buy myself a good sort of tagine Moroccan meal. But um, everything was shut. <laughs> and um, there was said, no, no one serving food, all the shops were shut. And it was actually Ramadan, and I had no idea that oh, I'd yeah. arrived in the time of Ramadan. So uh, <laughs> I, I couldn't eat, <laughs> so that was yeah, fine. Yeah. But then it's, it's worth it, because uh, once the, the clock hits 7 o'clock, suddenly all of the shop doors fling open, and everybody's inviting you into their house to have this giant banquet. And um, just banquet after banquet, you're suddenly invited in, and they sort of feed you on dates and this soup they called Herrera, which was like a, a flowery soup for breaking the fast. And, um, all, and then, yeah, kebabs and all these other fancy Moroccan things. So it was actually a great time to be in Morocco. And um, people are just so, so hospitable. You're constantly uh, getting invited in to, to come and share meals with them, but only after 7 o'clock. So you you got to make sure yeah, you, yeah. you fast for the rest of the day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So were you essentially hitching and then potentially just straight up asking people if you can get a ride with them. And then how were you finding a combination? Were you using couch surfing or anything like that? I, I used one couch surf. Like my first my first host in Morocco, I had organized with couch surfing before I got there. And then after that, I didn't do any more couch surfing. I just, I would hitch to my next spot. And basically either someone who picked me up would take me home to their house or um, I'd, at some point in the day, I'd get invited <laughs> to come into someone's house. And um, then often when I'd stay with someone, they'd tell me, oh, I've got a, a relative in the next town that you can stay with. So um, I think 
yeah, I met someone on the beach in a sealer and he invited, yeah, so I had my first couch surfing host and then he, he had a little job on the beach. He was a chef and he had this little sort of grass hut that he would cook these fish tagines on and serve to people on the beach. And I met somebody on the beach and he said, oh, when you're finished staying there, come and stay with me. So I, I went, moved and stayed with him in the, another town not too far away. And um, this guy basically just, he, I, I liked to work for my board, so I'd ask him to give me some jobs to do. So um, he had a, a small stone building that he was making that he wanted some help with. But mainly, he just asked me to push him in his hammock and sing to him all day. So um, <laughs> that was that was a rather cruisy job. I just pushed him and sang songs. And um, then, yeah, he had he had people come and stay, so I got to meet people and got to talk with them. He had reasonable English. And um, then from there, he said, oh, you can go and stay with my sister in the next town. So from there, I went, she, I think I, yeah, I stayed with his sister. Or maybe I ended up staying with his sister's was it? Was it, was it maybe it was a friend's <laughs> a friend's brother or something? Anyway, it was a man that I ended yeah, up yeah. staying with, and this guy had uh, like a three story house, and I was staying on the top floor. And he was an artist, so he was a painter, and he had also was a marathon runner. So he'd invite me to go running with him each day. So um, I'd sort of go out for a run, and then um, for for work for him, he didn't have any work for me, but he um, said that his sister had some work. So I would go to his sister's house and do, I think I was painting her porch and then go back and stay with him in the evenings. And then he introduced me to people in the town as well. And um, and then from there, I, th- I think I, I did do one Halpex host in Morocco, which was actually staying with an American family. And that was sort of a, a bit of an eye-opener because I'd been staying with these really hospitable, warm, friendly Moroccan people. And then my first sort of arrival to this American family was this sort of screaming at each other and this really tense environment and these this giant house with the children living in opposite ends of the house and everybody having so much space and so many possessions. And so that was a, such a contrast to living with the Moroccans who had mm. a gas cooker in one corner and a mat in the other corner. But, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. but these people had a, um, a guest house so they'd get people to come and stay there so uh, my job was to actually keep an eye on the garden staff because the gardeners <laughs> basically they would just go under a tree and sleep all day <laughs> that's what right. it seemed like and um, <laughs> and unless someone was there to monitor them all day then they, no work would get done which um i mean you can give them some um forgiveness because it was ramadan so they didn't have a whole lot of energy <laughs> but um mm-hmm. my job was just to go and and motivate the gardeners, which is quite a tough job. So the only way really I felt like I could do it was to actually work alongside them. It doesn't feel right to just stand there and tell people to work. But um, mm. I really enjoyed being with the gardeners. They were so much more friendly and warm and would invite me into their their gardeners' quarters for meals. And the the woman would ask me to marry them and a joke and things. <laughs> so um, they were they were much. When I when I left that place, I think I was there for maybe a month. But after I left there, I um, I hugged goodbye to all of the the staff, and I just sort of shook hands goodbye with the uh, the American family who were my hosts. Yeah, right. It was just yeah, um, yeah. much easier to make connections and you know, such warm people. But the, the the rest of my stays were actually um, just people I came across, and uh, some of them were um, people that they saw an English person. And someone that could speak English, they wanted me to to find uh, tourists for them. So um, one guy, he had a little tent in the middle of the desert on the roadside, and he had some old wells. I think it was like an under- underground aqueduct that was leading water into the city, but um, and it no longer actually carried water. But um, every time a car came past, which was like, maybe once or twice a day he would go out on the on the side of the road and wave his hands and and try and invite them in to come and have a tour down this tunnel and he would try and sell them um some fossils that sort of been dug up from from the area and so he said oh come and stay with me in my tent and it was a, a tent made out of camel fur 
and uh, I'm not sure it was, <laughs> wow. it was high enough to stand up in, but, and he was a really obese guy, <laughs> and he, he had just one, <laughs> one scooter, and my job was to try and was wave down tourists and bring them over, and if any arrived, then I was to speak with them in English and convince them to take a tour down the well. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> wow. I think by the time I was there, I might have only managed to stop one car, and there weren't that many cars. But um, I did, did <laughs> I did do some other useful work for him as well. He he had a website and he wanted some help with it. So um, in the evenings, we'd both jump on his little scooter, and he was this giant overweight man with a blue gown, like a lot of the guys there just wear these blue robes. So I would sit on the back behind him, we'd sort of scoot off into the nearby village, and he'd ask me to sing Tracy Chapman into his ear as we were going. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and then when we got there, he had a, a school room that he was using to help to um to work on his website, and he had some young guys there that were doing his website for him, but they needed translation. So they wanted me to translate what was on the website into English, and they were just using Google. I didn't, I couldn't understand Arabic, so um, we were using Google Translate to translate it, and then I was translating the the Google's translation into actually <laughs> sensical <laughs> English. Yeah, so, um, yeah. So that was my, my stay with him. Actually, uh, when I stayed with him, we'd have sort of one, one or two meals a day. He'd go out and he'd buy some veggies and bring them back, and we'd have a tagine, and um, but I think by this point, I was getting quite sick of tagines because basically that was the only meal that you ever got in Morocco was a tagine. And on a, on a Friday, you might get a couscous. Friday, sort of, often the family would get together and eat couscous. But um, the rest of the day, it was, rest of the week, it was tagine, which was basically potato, tomato, and oil, and some meat. And it was sort of simmered away for a long time. And it was really tasty. It's sort of um, paprika and and cumin, I think, were the main spices. Sometimes if you've got a, a, a more wealthy family that you're staying with, you might get some nuts and some apricots in there as well. Really tasty, but by the sort of the end of my stay at Morocco, I was getting quite sick of this meal, and I just wanted something fresh. You, could, you never really got a salad. So I was going for a walk in the desert, and I, I came across a, a fresh watermelon on the ground, and I was oh, this is my lucky day. It's something fresh. And... Um, because I was sort of just at the mercy of eating whatever the, the people I was staying with gave me. So I, I picked up this watermelon. It was like a baby watermelon, and I, I gave it a bite, and it was the most bitter, disgusting thing. I thought, that's definitely not a watermelon. And I, I spat it out. <laughs> I didn't even swallow it. But um, a few hours later, I'm not sure how long, long later it was, but I started getting achy joints and sweating and sick in the stomach. Oh, shit. And um, I told the guy what I was staying, what I, who I was staying with, what I had eaten. I sort of described it to him. And I think at the time we were um, working on his website. And so we got one of the guys to, to bring up a Google image on the screen. And he said, is this what you ate? And I said, yeah, yeah, that's it. That's the, the picture looks exactly like it. And he said, oh, gosh, we don't even touch that. That's so poisonous. We, we don't even touch it with our hands. Oh, fuck. So um, <laughs> then I thought, gosh, uh, I probably, uh, yeah, I'm glad I didn't swallow it, but I definitely put it in my mouth and... Um, so he took me to his mother, and she just you know, lived, lived in a simple home, just to concrete walls and um, in a kitchen and one I think two rooms. And she made up this poultice, and it was this sort of br- red poultice. I don't know what was in it, but maybe it looked like it had chili and paprika or something. And she yeah. she smeared it all over my feet, and then she I think I think she wrapped my feet up in, in newspaper and then put plastic bags on them. And then she got me to sleep there for the night. And um, in the morning, I woke up and she took off the plastic bags, took off the um, the newspaper, and then scraped the poultice off my feet. And my feet were now stained bright red. <laughs> and um, I guess the idea of this poultice was that it was going to suck out the poison. And I think by this time, I was actually feeling okay. So yeah. either it sucked out the poison and, and saved my life, or um, I was going to be okay anyway. But um, but my feet were red for, for weeks afterwards. I just couldn't get the red <laughs> off. And my toenails were stained red. So sort of months later, I still had sort of the remnants of Morocco. I could see sort of this little moon of red on the end of my toenails slowly growing out. So uh, <laughs> a reminder of, of that story. How many marriage proposals did you get? Oh, gosh, it's, it's hard to count. But I, I, probably, <laughs> I probably made more than, than I got given. I See, one of my... 
my ways of getting around Morocco was to offer my sister to people. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, well, she should be, be delighted. Really like that. <laughs> well, she she was living in New Zealand. She was miles away, and um, it seemed like she would not get touched. Yeah, so yeah, I felt yeah. like it was fairly safe to when people asked, um, "Have you got a sister?" Yes. Um, can I marry her? Um, well, let's let's just discuss it a bit, and then I mm-hmm. sort of go and stay with them for the night. <laughs> let's discuss it. But, um, discuss it over to Jean. Yeah, but but yeah. consequently, my sister got a whole lot of Facebook request um, friend requests from people in Morocco. So she sort of was writing to me, "Shas, why am I getting all of these friend requests <laughs> from people I don't know?" Yeah. So um, they were obviously. I think. I think perhaps to start with, I thought it was a bit of a joke and that they weren't serious. But I think a lot of them actually, yeah, thought there was a, a chance that they might get a um, a Western wife out of it, and they might get a, a ticket out of Morocco. Mm-hmm. As a, a lot of them did want to go and live in Europe, and um, but the because there, there is poverty in Morocco and it's difficult to find work. But um, the people that I met that had gone to to Europe for work and they'd come back to Morocco, they said that it seems alluring, but they much prefer living in Morocco because in, in Europe it's just such a rat race. And in Morocco, I think they would constantly have this phrase, uh, tranquilo, something or other, <laughs> but, um, and lax, lax without facts. I'm not sure what that means either, but it basically <laughs> something about relaxing. So... Very, very little work seemed to get done in Morocco, and there wasn't sort of this sort of obligation that you, if you weren't sort of toiling, then you weren't sort of morally sort of deserving of anything. Mm-hmm. They just sort of seemed to enjoy company and live on the bare necessities. Mm-hmm. Um, so the people that did go to Europe sort of decided to come back because they preferred the simple life of Morocco, yeah. at least the ones that I met that came back. That's uh, was, that was their reason for it. Yeah. Now, the last story I want to hear about Morocco is this date guy, because I remember that being a cracking story. Ah, oh, okay, and then, yes. <laughs> and then, then I'd love to talk a bit, a bit about India and your travels with the... Ab- Abdullah Wahib. Like, well. Okay, yeah. I, um, I wanted to get to the Sahara, so I, I hitchhiked sort of to basically where the road stops, and you keep on going, and then you stop and it gets to the Sahara, and there was no more road. And there was this little town on, on the edge of the desert, and I sort of walked through the town and I walked right until I got to the edge of the road and I was just looking out into the desert. And I mean, ever since I was a kid, I really loved sand dunes. We had great sort of family holidays on sand dunes. So I had this sort of romance attached to sand dunes for some reason. And I also just like dry, empty landscapes. I think um, my brain's too easily overwhelmed to, to look at uh, landscapes that are full of bush and things. So uh, just a, right. a desert seems really, really pleasant to me. So I was just really enjoying this desert landscape. And uh, I noticed there was a little hut on one little sand dune just right at the end of this road sort of leading to the desert. So I went up and there was a guy with a, a tea shop that was serving tea. And um, I just started talking to him and I said, uh, I'm looking for somewhere to stay and work in exchange for my my food and my bed do you have any work that i can do and he said well yes i do so he took me uh, sort of a few hundred meters down the road to an abandoned mud brick hotel and it was i think a hotel that maybe had been in his family but now it was completely abandoned walls had fallen down and it was the sand had blown in it was half buried in sand dunes and so we, we walked in through these ruins and he, he walked me to a room at the end, there's sort of maybe two rooms standing in this hotel. And he opened the door and the whole room was full of sand. And he said, um, well, your first job is to clean your room. <laughs> so um, <laughs> this was my bedroom where I was going to stay. So I spent sort of the day shoveling out all of the sand that was in the room. And I uncovered a bed <laughs> and I, I uncovered a rug. So I, um, I set up my little room. It was just all mud bricks. They sort of just completely made out of mud. They would um, put them in little forms and then lay them out on the ground to dry and then build buildings out of them. And um, so, yeah, I was sleeping in this mud room. And my next job was to take all of the mud bricks that had fallen down in this hotel and carry them over to his tea shop because he wanted to do some renovations on his tea shop. So, um, yeah, I spent the day carrying bricks across. But um, 
he didn't make me do that much work because um, in Morocco they didn't seem to have this sort of great admiration for work ethic. So I'd carry a few, few bricks and then he'd like me to just sit and talk with him for the rest of the, the day. And um, he would sort of just seem to spend his day doing nothing but looking out into the desert and waiting for customers. And I, I was there for a few weeks and I think one customer came and the whole time I was there and he, wow. he made them a cup of tea. That was it. <laughs> And wow. I saw nobody else. Um, I think one day we went to stay with, went to have couscous with his his mum in the village. But um, I'm not even sure what we talked about because I don't think he had that much English. But um, he liked to he, he brewed his own wine out of dates, or I guess it wasn't wine. It was just like a, an it was basically ethanol with probably <laughs> a, a bit of. I think there was probably a bit of methanol in there as well because um, I think I watched him do it and he was distilling it in a pressure cooker. But I think you're really supposed to pour off the first part of the distill because that's usually methanol and right. you don't want to be drinking that. But he wouldn't pour off the first part. He would just keep everything. And this stuff was, yeah, just jet fuel. It was really potent, strong, transparent liquid that would eat. And I think I would drink out of these, um, I'm not sure if they were even, they might have been shot glasses that he had. But he invited a friend over one night and he invited a couple of prostitutes over as oh, well. Wow. So um, there I was in this room with um, these two Moroccan guys, this date ethanol and a couple of prostitutes. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it was really interesting to get a window on that experience because the, the, the men and the women don't interact that much in Morocco. They, um, the men are really affectionate with each other. They seem to hold hands and hug and things, but I, you didn't often get to sit for a long time with a woman. So basically what these prostitutes did was just sit and talk with them and they sort of lay their heads on their laps or the, the, the men lay their heads on the Moroccans' laps as if they were mum and the, the, the woman stroked their heads and, um, and they had some date ethanol and I'm not sure if any anything more than that actually happened between them but I, two of them did go off to, um, to they disappeared for a while and then came back later so um, I think I figured out what happened then they they actually went to my bedroom in the uh, in the broken down hotel <laughs> and um <laughs> <laughs> and they did have have some fun in there probably but why the why I knew they were in there was because now my money had gone I had some euros that I'd just been carrying with me keeping safe and I put it under that mattress and oh, now shit. that was gone so now I had no money literally <laughs> yeah. I, I did have I did still have a card that I could use but I think I could only use that in Europe to get money out so I'm, I'm not sure if I had any coins at all. I might have had some very, very few amount, very small amount of money. And I think I just decided I wasn't going to spend that because that was my emergency money. And yeah. I still needed something to actually catch the ferry back to Spain. Yeah, so yeah. Um, if I wasn't able to, to busk for my, my ride home. So I basically yeah. Yeah, went the rest of the way without spending money, which I hadn't really spent any money to begin with in Morocco. But that sort of just forced me to be... Um, a bit more open to whatever fate threw at me. And so, yes, yeah, I did stay with quite a few more people and they were all very interesting experiences and there was probably a whole lot that I don't remember. I'll have to go and read through my, my blog posts again to actually figure out what happened. So Morocco and then you hit a bunch of other places and made your way to India and then cycled for 2,500 kilometres in a circuit on the hand hand track yeah so i i um i got to india i had a couple of weeks maybe a month uh in the north of india just exploring as a tourist and i did some some help ex jobs worked on a farm there for a bit uh i think an, an amla farm i was, seemed to be mainly weeding but um india was interesting you you, they, you wake up in the morning and they give you this really strong sugary tea to drink maybe 6 a.m and then you go and work out in the fields for three hours and then you come back and they cook you up a breakfast which I think was um, often this sort of fried ricey squashed rolled rice sort of thing I'm not sure I even knew what it was um, or um, another nice breakfast was idli and samba which is sort of these little rice flour dumpling sort of things with coconut chutney on them and 
So uh, the Indi- food in India was great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. When it when it didn't make you sick. <laughs> if, if you don't like <laughs> curry, then don't go to India. But I yeah, I really yeah. enjoy curry. So yeah. um, I'm just gonna plug in my my charger on my phone to make sure it doesn't go go flat. There we go. Um. So. Yeah, then you know, I'd planned to visit this guy in the south of India who was making tricycles. And my plan was to go and help him to make them and to take one of the tricycles and use it on my journey. And then we would find people and we would make more tricycles and donate them to the people that I, that I found. Mm-hmm. So I turned up to meet this guy in the south of India. He was uh, this really devout Christian guy. And he loved singing country western songs, <laughs> and, he, and he sang in this really strong American accent. So um, amazing, and played the keyboard, and um, also loved singing um, Christian songs. So I think every morning we would sing a Christian song and we would pray together. <laughs> yeah. And um, but I got to his house expecting to see this great workshop where tricycles got made, and basically it was just his porch, and he had one drill press and maybe a hacksaw <laughs> and wow. and absolutely no sort of skills <laughs> in constructing things. <laughs> right. So I, I was sort of feeling like, right, well, I'm, I'm not, I haven't got much to, to start with here in terms of um, <laughs> having it going for a trip around India on something. <laughs> so I, I started working on a tricycle with him and we spent a, uh, maybe three weeks sort of trying to make a prototype, which we did. We, we sort of found we wanted to use some old bicycles and combine them together. And then we um, found a we found a welder in the town that could do some welding for us. And amazing how everything in India seems to happen on the floor. Their, their factories and their workshops are just dirt floors. And it's just amazing what they can produce. And even, even really intricate bronze sculptures with six arms and ten trunks and things but they really decorative ornate stuff and it's all done on a dusty floor and out in the backyard sort of thing but um i i realized after one week of well, maybe it was three weeks we had this prototype tricycle which would sort of work but i realized in order to um there was no way we we're going to be making this guy was going to be making hundreds of these to dish out to, to people across india so the best way to do it was to find an existing distributor of tricycles in India and use their cycle. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> um, we found we found this other company that was that was making cycles and distributing them and asked if I could use one of theirs. They didn't donate one to us, but they did um, I think give us a discounted price. And um, and I tried it out and it seemed to be pretty pretty good for um, reliability. So. Um, then I waved goodbye to to my friend Thomas, who I'd been helping with um, with the tricycles. And up until then, I was staying in an orphanage. He had um, put me up with a friend of his who had an orphanage nearby. Um, so I'd, it was a, a an all girls orphanage, and the lady that ran it was actually a New Zealand lady. And every all the kids called her Mummy, and she was in maybe in her sixties or seventies at that time. And she'd been running this orphanage, I don't know, for 40 years or something. Oh, we'd wow. been there for a long time. And, uh, yeah, really had this relationship with these girls and seen a lot of them, sort of known them for their whole lives and seen them leave and then come back to even work at the orphanage. So I got to spend time with her and with these these orphan girls. And um, But then, yeah, waved goodbye to Thomas and hopped on my tricycle and, and headed off to my first destination, and um, Thomas knew a few people around the south of India, so he had um, planned a few people I, I could stay with for the first few nights, which was really helpful. And um, gosh, I, I I wrote blog posts for this story, this journey, as I was going. Every day I'd write a diary entry. And um, then I think I was, I was using my Kindle to actually type things in which was an incredibly laborious process but I, I managed <laughs> yeah. to sort of get free internet wherever I was and type it on my kindle so I had sort of no spell check and my spelling's atrocious so I sort of it came out very poetic in a, in a lot of places <laughs> but um I ever since every time I wrote since writing each of those posts I never went back and read them 
So um, since talking to you recently and you seemed interested in this India story, I thought I'd better just have a quick glance over some of those um, those posts. So I, I googled myself and I rediscovered my old India by Hand track podcast. And um, I don't know, is it, what do people say that every seven years your your body completely regenerates itself? That you, uh, yeah, right, yeah. Well, uh, I mean, that's probably a myth or an old wives piece of science, but um, it's been at least seven years since I was in India. <laughs> so um, technically, I'm not the same person <laughs> that cycled through India. Mm-hmm. And um, reading through these posts, it, it also didn't feel like I was reading my own words. Just because um, I'd never, I never read through them again. I never rev- revised. Um, my experiences and uh, and uh, even as I was reading them I was sort of hanging on the edge of my seat thinking what happens next and <laughs> they were really well written of... man <laughs> well, like really, they were very really... compelling and very very direct prose raw prose from where you were that day I really enjoyed reading those yeah I, I think I just enj- I had all day on my cycle getting to just digest words inside of my head and you sort of got this monotonous, rhythmic thump of your hands going around <laughs> in front of you, and you're just toiling up hills, and then you're cruising down hills, and your brain's just free to play with words all day long. And at th- that point in my life, I really loved words, and I wrote a lot of songs, and um, and just, you know, I loved describing what I was seeing in India. And it, India has just had so much to offer in terms of content for, for to write about. When I was in France and Germany and in Spain, there was uh, things were interesting enough, but I never felt like I had enough content in India. You just it's it's on tap everywhere you look, everywhere is a festival. <laughs> yeah. It's um, I mean, basically every day seems to be some sort of festival, at least because there's so many religions, everyone's celebrating something on on some day, and there's these Muslims and Hindus and um, Sikhs and. Christians and they're all um, all got their temples on opposite sides of the road and they're all blasting their music at the same time. You'll you'll sort of hear this. <laughs> I was on a on a on a bus in India one night on a sleeper bus and I, I got woken up because the bus pulled over and I could hear this sort of rave music going on. So I opened my bus curtain and looked out and there's all this rave music and flashing lights and there's just two old guys sitting on a porch <laughs> and they're, they're playing this blur- blaring music and they've got these flashing <laughs> lights around them and they're just sort of sitting there having a cigarette <laughs> at sort of 3am yeah. on the porch. They, they seem to be n- really um, desensitised to stimulus. I think yeah, um, right. perhaps it goes with having really strong food. You just sort of, you can cope with really strong stimulus. So you need flashing lights and loud music and uh, when I went to a couple of church services, because a lot of people I stayed with um, were people that were from a church and they connected me with the next church and the next church. So I went to a couple of church services and they would blare their music so loud that it would be distorting. And but <laughs> everyone loved it. <laughs> sort of the yeah, distortion yeah. was part of the enjoyment. Yeah, right. But um, anyway, reading these stories that I'd written, uh, some of it I remembered and some of it, as I read, it sort of, gave me access back to those memories that I'd forgotten. And some of them I just couldn't even remember. I said, gosh, is that me? (laughs) Did that happen? I can't put a face or a picture to it. And then reading through sort of my blog post, I'm talking about these, it seems like real feats of endurance, and I'm hauling this tricycle up hills, and then I'm peddling it through sort of knee-deep water and, (laughs) these <laughs> knee-deep potholes and trucks roaring past me and showering me in water and it's dark and I can't see and I've got one <laughs> hand on the trike and one hand on my sort of flickering flashlight and I'm sort of freezing cold up in the mountains and I don't know where I'm going to stay that night. And, yeah, when I read it, it sort of I, I feel almost um, like I, I can't take take credit for that sort of endurance anymore that was that was a seven year old seven years ago me that was that's not, I don't, don't even have the same cells as that person anymore mm-hmm. but whoever it was it seems to um, either have be able, been able to in, endure a lot or they've been able to um, use words in a way that makes it sound like they're enduring a lot uh, <laughs> so, but I, I, no doubt no doubt you endured a lot you did two and a half thousand kilometers around India on a hand track 
But I think that's a fucking endurance, I think basically, endurance mission, dude. At, at the end of it, I just had this realization <laughs> that no matter what situation you get put into, you tend, if you've got no option but to keep going, then that's what yeah. you do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. at yeah. the end of it, you don't regret it. Yeah. So it sort of just makes you feel a little less afraid about life and a little um, less afraid about taking risks. And um, I sort of think that, that this is basically what I wanted out of my whole overseas experience was sort of after having sort of four years cooped up in, in university and killing any sort of personality and <laughs> turning my brain completely into a, a book, um, being stuck inside a book and a desk and a computer that just I wanted to really get dirt under my fingernails and sweat and bleed and get rained on and <laughs> suddenly is what happened. And yeah, to yeah. see how different people lived and yeah. decide what was going to be the best way to continue with my life because I just because I, I've grown up in, in, a, in one particular country and seen the way people live there doesn't mean I have to continue and choose that sort of lifestyle for myself. And I, I definitely saw going through Morocco and going through India that people could live very minimal lives and they, they didn't have that many possessions and... Um, Partly that was, well, I guess largely because of poverty, but a lot of them still had the, the bare necessities to be happy and mm. um, had, had their family and were really, really hospitable and friendly. So um, it, it definitely made me not feel like I, I needed to toil through life to gain a big house and a whole lot of positions that I didn't really need. And... Um, well, currently, actually, as I record this, I'm sitting in my house bus. <laughs> so mm. um, I, I, I did come home and I so far haven't um, got myself a big house or a corporate job, but I uh, bought an old school bus and turned it into a house, which um, we were living in for a, a few weeks. We um, we'll soon will be moving it to our new property and living on it there. But um, the idea for now is also just yeah to, to keep life simple and really decide what com complexity we want to add to it and not become a slave to our possessions mm. and just what we really do spend time on things we really want to be doing but um yeah where was i with india <laughs> you mentioned earlier that you you came into a few precarious characters and a few precarious situations so i wonder if you better choose one or two of those where it was because it's a very risky thing to you know yeah, take a hand trike to a thousand kilometers around India on your own with no money. Like <laughs> some yeah. people would consider that fucking crazy. I think it's fucking awesome. But well, yeah, a lot of surely there were, were a few few like precarious situations, and they're always amazing stories. So I'm wondering if you could bring one or two of those up and right. <laughs> um, okay, <laughs> the, there are there are a few um, sort of wilderness reserves in India. So. Um, there was at least one time where I found myself going through a wilderness reserve and there was just no way I could get to where I needed to go any other way. This was the only road and it was just a very rough potholed road in the middle of nowhere and you, you see, a, you start, you're triking along and you see a sign with a big tiger on it saying you're now entering such and such reserve, sort of don't stop your car at any point. And um, here I am on this tricycle feeling incredibly vulnerable <laughs> and um Jesus. and there's, there's all these potholes and there's no I mean, I'm, I'm walking i'm going f sort of maybe a, a brisk walking pace if if that <laughs> and um then then your chain falls off and you got to stop and, and put the chain back on with sort of shaking hands and you're hoping that no no um predators creep up on you <laughs> and um and you're still pedaling along and you know, you can see signs saying sort of 10 more kilometers until the end of the reserve. You're like, okay, I got to get to the end of the reserve. And they're saying, avoid driving through at dusk. And okay, 10 <laughs> more kilometers and, and it's getting darker and darker and you, you, you can only go so fast and you're, you're pedaling as fast as you can and you feel like your biceps are bleeding <laughs> just from yeah. all the, uh, the lactic acid and you just want to get out of this reserve before the sun goes down. So um, th those were some scary moments, but I definitely got through those okay. And um, other moments were just when there was this monsoon rain, which, um, yeah, was, wasn't the best time of year to be doing it, but I think it was hard to really pick up time that was good everywhere. But 
just incredibly heavy rain and, and wind. And at one point I was in a hurricane and there's often not anywhere just to take shelter. You're just in the middle of nowhere. And this, this, at one point I actually, I think I was trying to pedal forward with my hands and I completely came to a standstill. The wind was blowing against me and my arms just weren't strong enough to pedal the bike against the wind. Wow. So the points where I was going nowhere <laughs> and, um, and the rain's pouring down and you're getting wet. And I think often when it rained, I would try and um, I had this tarp that I'd put over me and I'd tie it to the track and I'd sit there and try and wait for the rain to, to pass. And then I'd pull the tarp off and keep on riding again. But um, other times it was getting dark and you had to get to the next town and it was raining. So you just had no choice but to keep going, especially when my headlight wasn't that strong either. But um, then you'd get to the next town and there would be no accommodation so um, some nights I was lucky and, and Thomas had, um, my friend with back in the first village, had known somebody and he could organise someone to, that could have me up for the night. But at other times, well, mo- most of the nights that wasn't possible, I just had to find something. And so some nights you just end up, I think one night I was sleeping underneath a lathe in a workshop with two other young boys. <laughs> I just sort of met them on the roadside and they said, yeah, you can come and sleep with us. And they obviously didn't weren't allowed to sleep in their house anymore or, or they decided to live in this in this workshop. But, um, yeah, when it's pouring down with rain, you just got to keep on going t- until you get to the next town. Yeah. And, um, but, every, yeah, it, it always worked out fine. You know, scary situations with people. I mean, you didn't really have anything to roll apart from uh, the, the yeah, bike, I suppose. not but. with people. I never, I never felt like people were going to hurt me. I felt like the people in India were really gentle. Um, I felt like they were going to swindle me and deceive me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I felt like you, you couldn't trust them. You used to guess that's sort of the um, stereotypical uh, Indian idea that we have that they're sort of very cunning business people. And I, I did get that impression, but... I never felt like they were going to physically hurt me. So I guess I was sort of worried about my tricycle getting stolen and things, and I'd try and chain it up and not let it out of my sight or bring it into bring it into my room with me where I was staying. But um, don't I can't remember any any times where I actually felt in danger. Was so, that your whole? Sorry. Was that in your in, in your entire experience on the overseas without um, money? Uh, no, there were definitely times. I, I remember one night in Morocco, I was. I was in the desert in Morocco and had nowhere to sleep for the night. So I just, I mean, Morocco is quite nice because it was dry at that time and there was no monsoon rain. Basically, you could just lie in the ditch at the end of the day and go to sleep, wake up in the morning. And life was so simple. You didn't even need clothes. It was so warm. But um, though in the desert, it can get quite cold in the evenings. But one night I was in the desert and I, I lay down to sleep for the night. And then I could hear this little pitter pattering of feet off in the distance, and um, I had heard that you should be uh, beware of wolves while you're in the desert. So um, I just heard this pitter pattering of feet, and I thought I could see sort of some some glistening moonlit sort of figures darting across in the distance, and then darting across on the other side. And oh gosh, I'm being circled. So I sort of gathered myself gather myself a collection of rocks and thought of at least if some wolves come towards me or the best I can do is throw rocks at them and um, I didn't get much sleep that night but I kept on hearing the, the pitter pattering and then eventually it, it sort of faded away and then the sun rose <laughs> so mm-hmm. um, that, that might not have been a dangerous moment it might have just been a paranoid moment but um, mm-hmm. either way I didn't, didn't get much sleep and I collected a few rocks but um I guess most people I stayed with in Morocco, I thought they were out to hurt me, <laughs> at least to start with. I thought they were going to steal my money or they were going to drug me. And they would invite me into their house and I'd be on guard the whole time. And some of them seemed to just be, even be squatting. One, one person invited me off the street to come into his house and it seemed like he was squatting. He had no power and no water and he just sort of was using one room in the house. And he cooked me up um, like a, a packet soup. On, on a gas cooker and me and him and his partner shared this this packet tomato soup for dinner it was a very measly dinner and I just this was a complete stranger I thought he's, I'm sure he's out to, to rob me with my sleep 
or to sell my liver or something. But yeah, yeah. at the same time, I, I wanted to trust people because that was how I was getting to have insights into into these people's homes and lives um, by just sort of being trusting. I mean, not being um, completely stupid at the same time, but still trying to allow myself to experience um, the real experiences. And I f- every time I would feel nervous about being in danger with these people, and at the end I would feel guilty because I had uh, I feel guilty that I'd thought bad of them when really they were just selflessly offering their friendship and their time and their meal and their home and mm. hugging me goodbye. And I sort of yeah felt guilty for for not trusting them. So yeah, I didn't well it wasn't actually in danger a lot of times when I felt I was in danger. Hmm. That's pretty remarkable for such an epic, uh, epic journey. But that just goes to show, right? I think a lot of, a lot of our prejudices toward people are perhaps unfounded, and there's a lot of fear. I mean, of course, there are always going to be situations where intuition is required, and you have to be careful. I've had a few of those in Europe, but yeah, that's quite an amazing amazing thing that most of your precarious situations were more to do with the weather or just not having somewhere to stay than the people. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess I I felt in the end that all I really cared about losing was my life. (laughs) Um, Yeah. So uh, anything else was just sort of a, a good, a good bargain for an experience. I sort of got some money stolen. <laughs> yeah. That that was basically me just paying for the um, the ability to see how far I could get without spending money. And yeah. um, it was, um, yeah, I, the, the people were never, never. Well, I, I mean, I, I could have been fortunate. And I think if I was a woman doing it, I you might not have had as much luck. But um, yeah. Yeah. Part part of my actual success was probably that I had long blonde hair, so a lot of people thought I was a woman, <laughs> and then when they got up <laughs> when they got up close to me, they realised that I wasn't. But by then it was sort of too late to um to not invite <laughs> me into their car, <laughs> so that that made it easier for hitchhiking. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah. but either way, it was that was they're still really hospitable people, and they, so um. I think I will still do. Any any guy going through Morocco, I think is going to have um, success at, at interacting with the locals, but yeah. only if he doesn't go to too many tourist spots. And the tourist spots, you're just completely hounded, and you get the worst impression of the people, and you just mm. see them as being sneaky and devious and and hounding you constantly for b- bartering for what you're going to pay and trying to take you around to all of these different f- shops that their friends own so they can all get commissions and you never get any peace. But if you can get away from the tourist spots and just meet the people that have nothing that they feel like they're going to gain from you um, other than that they're really interested to interact with you because they've never had that opportunity before, then mm. you end up meeting really the, the best kinds of people. That's a really good tip. I've spoken before about adventure and I... I had this idea that an adventure isn't a true adventure without the risk of death. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it's I did a sort of similar, no, nowhere near similar, actually, nowhere near as crazy as your adventure. But I did a, what I considered pretty crazy for myself, adventure through Europe. Um, booked myself 28 or so solo shows, <clears throat> bought a Japanese family car for 500 euros and then made my way around a bunch of different countries all the way to the south of France and back up to Berlin within, I think, 40 days or something and managed to play 28 shows that I booked myself and came out at the end, like I think, with a thousand euros in the green or something like that, and then was very sick for two weeks. I was Okay, what, what did you get sick on? Uh, it turned out to be mono or EBV, Epstein-Barr virus. I picked it up somewhere along along the way, probably due to my exhaustion of driving mm. uh, every day and sleeping only about five hours and living on coffee. My body just yeah. packed up. But um, but yeah, there were a few hairy moments there. But like, it's inspiring to hear of your adventures and 
developing countries where it's a lot more simple and the people are the culture is incredibly different and it's a completely different lifestyle i find that so inspiring and i definitely want to do that at some point the one that i've i'd really love to mm. do sometime is have you heard of the mongol rally no nah. so these these guys i think it was around the 2000s a couple of guys in the uk were hung over and they decided it would be a good idea to take a shitty car and drive it to mongolia from england and so they just tried to do that. They did it with, I think, a box of cigars, uh, a knife, um, <laughs> a tiny <laughs> amount of money, and just the clothes they had on their back, something crazy like that. Yeah. And it developed into this this yearly rally that they've been doing nearly every year. And it's a race to get to Mongolia. I think they now it just ends up on some border of Mongolia because of border issues. But you can take any route you want. But the rule is you have to buy your car for under 500 euros and you just have to get there as fast as possible. And you have to, uh, I think you have to raise over a thousand pounds for charity, something like that. And so there's a bunch of people do that every year and you have to, people have talked about ending up in Kazakhstan and their, their cars broken down and they've had to take horses and do all sorts mm. of crazy stuff to get to Mongolia. And I think that'd be, that'd be a pretty wild journey. Uh, yeah, I think it's great that you're committed to something and you feel like all of these people are, are sort of hinging on your getting to this location. Yeah. And yeah. there's there's not many moments in life we can sort of fabricate that situation anymore because <laughs> I think if, if we need medicine, we can sort of get it posted to us. or um, mm. it's, it's, Unless we sort of make a journey like that and and attach it to some sponsorship and then we can sort of feel justified in putting ourselves in this um, constant near-death experience. Yeah, that, that sounds that sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> I, um, I wonder how my um, how I would travel these days. I, um, I haven't done any more traveling by myself. Well, since, since that big OE, my travel by myself has mainly been to go in and learn things. Um, sort of I guess at that point in time being in a third world country was quite a novelty for me so I found everything very curious about how people lived and, and I loved how in India life and death was happening out on the street around you people were cooking people were pooing people I'm not sure anyone was, was making love but I'm sure it was happening somewhere and it's people were just life was going on you felt immersed in it and then you get back to to New Zealand and everything's so clean and pristine and and everyone's hidden away inside their houses and you can't mm. sort of can't see the machine of life ticking anymore and suddenly you feel a bit lonely and I, I think that's what I liked in India that you really felt like you were immersed in the machine of life um, then my my dad arrived with me he he came to India to do the last 500 kilometers with me. And um, so we got him another tricycle and he did the last 500 Ks. And I think I felt a bit offended by his, his experience of India. Ah, oh, there's poo everywhere and the people, are, you can't trust them. And, and um, for me, the rubbish and the poo <laughs> and sort of the, the unpredictability <laughs> and the, the roads that were full of potholes was, was what I liked. But um, for him, he he grew up in Africa, and that was just his childhood. <laughs> that uh, was uh, yeah. just lack of maintenance, and um, there there was no romance to it for him. Right. Yeah, yeah. I, I think um, for me, there still was a bit. But I, I, I think when I've, I've since then, I've been with my my partner to to Vietnam, and to South America. And we didn't travel as rough as I was traveling on my own. We did still do some couch surfing. Um, she was adamant not to do any hitchhiking. And, um, but we still, um, we, we weren't staying in luxury hotels or anything. But um, I think the, the, the novelty of the poverty was, was less for me this time. Mm. But, um, but I don't know, I'd be curious to go back to India or back to Morocco because maybe there was something different about those places. I think it's it's quite likely that there's just something about India that gets under your skin because everything's so intense, the, the food's intense, the music's intense, the colours are intense. 
So um, really strong sort of impressions that can get made on you. And there's a lot to be said about tr- solo traveling, right? Yeah, definitely. Like I've I've also I've also traveled with friends and in groups, and it's a totally different dynamic than doing it on your own. And there's a bunch of experiences that I never would have had, uh, even just with one other person. You just there's so many more options when you're when you're solo, and yeah, and as you mentioned before, unfortunately that that's not open. The whole world isn't open for that experience to to women because it is a lot more dangerous in certain parts of the world. But um, certainly for young men who are looking for adventure and looking to learn more about the world and themselves, it's definitely an incredible thing to do. Oh yeah, I definitely recommend it. And it's, it's not, um, it's not for fun. (laughs) Don't don't expect it to be fun. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. I think, um, I know I was reading one of the blog posts and I can't remember exactly what I'd, written but something along the lines of this wasn't supposed to be a walk in the park it was supposed to be a sort of a a grueling slog and trudge through sewage and (laughs) rain and (laughs) and um that's certainly what it was but um well I guess that wasn't really what it was intended to be but it was intended to be sort of challenging and eye-opening to to learn about what I was capable of and what I would how I would cope in certain situations and um, and learning to trust people and learning, learning just putting the bar really low for the rest of your life <laughs> in the sense <laughs> yeah. that I now know I don't need much and therefore I'm not a slave to thinking that I need a lot yeah. and therefore I can do with my life the things that I really want to do with my life. Yeah. So I think, I think that's why it's important to do it at a young age. Yeah. Yeah, because it's quite a quite a crazy disparity when you think about it. I imagine the, the guy in the desert that had the well aqueduct thing and the camel hair tent. I imagine that he didn't need resource consent and all of these things to build his, <laughs> you know, to stake his claim on oh, that aqueduct. Gosh. Did he even own it? I mean, like, who does not even even care? Is it just yeah. he just found that aqueduct? I don't and think so. He's trying to, you know it's out of mega living doing that and somehow it's working for him and you know or or as you were saying in morocco where when it's the dry season and you don't even necessarily need shelter because Mm. there's no rain there's no cold weather you can just lie down on the earth and, and sleep and it's just yeah it blows my mind that you know take new zealand for example if if anybody in christchurch the city that i live if you want to buy a house the median price is somewhere around four hundred five hundred thousand for like a modest house like an average house that a lot of people would want and most people to pay that off are going to be working for 30 or 40 years of their life which is you know half maybe half of their life just just to have shelter and it's a really weird thing to me that we haven't quite figured out how to create this shelter thing really cheaply and efficiently and this energy thing really cheaply and efficiently like to be fair it's not too expensive here for energy but i imagine you know uh the information thing you know internet is becoming cheaper and it's getting more widely distributed which is a good thing uh and the food thing i mean also i wouldn't consider the quality of and variety of food that we can get here is not for the price i think is pretty okay but it is just a weird disparity between those two worlds where it seems like in a lot of places in Africa, they just think about the next day. They don't think about the next year or or 10 years ahead. They they have their house, they have their family, have their friends, and they think they live hand to mouth and that's a good and a bad thing. But it's just surely there's somewhere in the middle where people in developed countries don't need to slave for half of their life just to have some of the basic things and security that people want and surely there's surely people in developing countries don't need to live day to day and not and be without access to internet and clean water and things it just seems like with all the resources we have in the world these problems aren't they're they're huge at their scale but at the ground of the problems they're very simple I guess 
we're being told that we we should want more in the West, and this I guess there's a sort of consumerism and <laughs> capitalist um, system going on that um, needs to be constantly fueled. But um, people sort of buy into this belief that they they need more than they actually do, and that it's gonna bring them happiness. But um, yeah, at the same time, you, you don't want to be like, yeah. A lot of the people I stayed with seem to be just above hand to mouth. But it's not always easy to tell. But yeah, you you don't want to be constantly stressing about whether you're going to get enough food or not either. But um, I think I find it interesting that because when they say that humans have this ability to project ourselves into the future and project ourselves into the past. So we've got this great ability to not only feel the sadness of now, but also the, <laughs> the sadness of the future <laughs> and the past all at once. Isn't that great? But um, yeah, yeah. if you're living hand to mouth, I feel like that that um, that projection distance probably gets decreased slightly. So mm. that was sort of the, the impression of it. They they really uh, uh, the small pleasures are more noticed, perhaps just mm-hmm. the the lying with your head on a prostitute's lap <laughs> and um, the, the sharing couscous with mum on a Friday afternoon. But, um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's it will just, yeah, conversation and talking with your friends and not so much striving to, to be the the best gardener out of all the gardeners and, and not fall asleep under the tree. But um, hmm. whether, whether having... Yeah, being just above the hand to mouth line uh, helps with that. Uh, I'm I'm not sure. Yeah, and there's this notion of status games, which everybody in developing countries are caught up in in one way or another. And of course, <clears throat> those with power and those with seek power, that's that's the game now. It's not about money; it's about status. And I've also heard from people that have travelled through parts of Africa that i mean status can can be very petty and very small as well of course but so how do you um, how do you quantify status <laughs> what, what is what is status uh well it maybe that's the key to why you're saying people you know want more and you know in the west or they want a bigger house or they want a flasher car um because it signals to their peers that they are they have equal or higher status and that's an important thing for them for whatever reason and i don't know if we can transcend it because a lot of those are the incentives for people to do great work and if you don't get any reward for your great work i mean it might be rewarding for yourself but just intrinsically on its own and that would be very pure and wonderful but maybe we would have a lot less invention because of that that's a very tricky one but i think that status thing is a as a key to the puzzle as well. I guess the problem is also partly that we're searching for status, but also that our, our symbols of status, the way that we measure status, um, could be changed as well. We don't have to see a, a big car and a big... I mean, I, I personally would feel a bit embarrassed about having a really big house and a really flash car. And <laughs> I think my, my dad would call me poverty-minded <laughs> and call me a rag and bone man. But um, I, obviously there's a there's a... There's a balance, but um, I, I'd feel more sense of pride and status if I came up with a, a, a new scientific theory or I created some really enlightening piece of artwork or something. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, I wanted to ask you about a few things that you mentioned that you've been focusing on this past few years. So one of those is deep learning. The other one is Memory Palaces, and then I want to hear about your new podcast. One thing I've come across as a way to retain information is, is this idea of Memory Palaces. And um, they're something that was used a long time ago before literacy became so so common. And ancient Greeks would remember long public speeches by sort of creating a mental path around their village or their home and attach different ideas to um, to each place in that mental path. So when they got up in public to to say their, their speech, they could just sort of mentally walk through that path and, and pick up each idea. And that's sort of a much more fluid than using notes and cue cards. And especially if you don't have the ability to write, 
then um, that works as well. And then ancient cultures, like the Aboriginal cultures, would use it for um, tying stories to, to landscapes and often that would be useful information for how to survive and uh, where they could find food and, and, and what they could eat. So in Stonehenge, they even t- um, theorise could have been a, a memory palace and that each different ideas are attached to each stone and, and every little crack and, and dimple in the stone can have an idea in it as well. And that would help you to, to structure and retain your information and teach it. So sort of I've started this podcast as I hope to try and um, structure information for my own brain and to pass it on to other people in that format and um, yet to see how, how well that works and what sort of systems work best for people. Our brains really evolved to primarily to make us move about in the environment, or at least that's it's, as I see it and what I think a lot of people um, believe. So I think it, our brains are quite efficient at using those sort of spatial navigation pathways and um, and, and language and rhyme and, uh, and story as well, which has context. So if we can teach sort of dry and abstract ideas with using, leveraging sort of those, those neural processes that we're good at, then I think we can make it easier to learn and, and retain things. And what's the podcast called? Uh, it's called Memory Land, and uh, there's a, a little logo of a, of a tree on a hill that looks a bit like a, a human head. It's got a couple of ears, and there's a, a tree coming out the top of this hill, and the tree looks a bit like a brain. It's got these two sort of separate hemispheres and, and pink leaves on it. And that should be on, on Apple Podcasts now and Spotify and CastBox and yeah, iTunes and the general places. I think it's slowly <laughs> getting accepted to those. And is there anywhere else where people can find your work, like your your inventions and uh, yeah, my website you've made? Um, my website has a lot of videos of the things that I make, so different robotic things and and sculptures that I've made. And that is um, www.contraption-cart.com. So um, we can do a Google search that or put it in the show notes. And is there anywhere people can find your blog, your raw seven-year-old travel blog? Uh, yeah, if they, experiences? If they um, do a Google search for in- India by hand to trike, Shasa Bolton, S-H-A-S-A, then they should find that in the Google search. It seems to come up when I do it. Nice. Be, be, be warned that there's, there's plenty of spelling mistakes there. <laughs> and it's... Um, yeah, it's, it's raw. It's, it's very raw. raw. from the Kindle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll put, I'll put all that stuff in the show notes anyway. But um, hey, thanks so much for, for having a chat, man. It's been really fun. And um, wish you all the best with your new podcast venture. Yeah, it's um, been my pleasure. Thanks for, for letting me have a chat. And um, some hopefully, hopefully, no, no sort of natural disasters come out of our conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking hell. Yeah, hopefully not. If they do, if there's something happens as soon as we hang up this phone call, um, I think we just have to cut all contact. <laughs> yeah, pro- probably would be the right thing to do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Have a good day. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.